Welcome. By the first decade of the 20th century, the scramble for Africa, which we examined in our last lecture, was over. Virtually all of the continent belong to one or another European empire. French, British, Portuguese, Belgian, German, the odd corner or two for Spain or Italy. The exceptions, the only exceptions, were Ethiopia, where the emperor's army had repelled an Italian advance in 1896, and Liberia, which had been created by former slaves from the United States. Colonial Africa then was a reality. What difference did this make? Although colonies surely varied one from another, and changed over time, they shared some fundamental characteristics which we outline in this lecture. In the next, we will look at some of those variations and some of those changes in more detail. All the colonial powers, naturally enough, sought economic gain from their new possessions. We know from our survey of the forces behind the scramble that economic factors were among the various motivations leading them to go into Africa in the first place. And after all, colonial conquest and occupation was not cheap. It was expensive in both financial and a human sense. It cost money and it cost blood. It was not surprising, therefore, it is not surprising, that they expected some return on that investment, how would they seek it? They sought it primarily by pursuing a far more thoroughgoing exploitation of Africa's raw material products than had previously been possible. Now, by raw materials, I refer primarily to things coming out of the earth, either mineral resources or cash crops. Colonies tended in the 20th century then to become mono-economies. Let us introduce that term. I think it will have relevance and application in later lectures as well. Mono-economies specializing in the increased production for export of a single commodity. Now, it's a slight overstatement actually to say mono-economy. It might be two commodities or three. But nonetheless, the notion of this intense concentration on one or at most a few commodity products for export became characteristic of virtually all the colonial economies. Over the time, over time in the 20th century then, territories become identified with, in some cases become almost synonymous with a certain kind of primary product. So that Senegal becomes synonymous with peanuts. The Ivory and Gold Coasts, although they're obviously named for other kinds of things coming out of Africa in an earlier period, become identified in the 20th century with cocoa. Kenya, synonymous with tea and coffee production. Uganda, with cotton. The Belgian Congo, with rubber and copper. Northern Rhodesia, as well, with copper, and so on. Now, to move these products from the points of production, the places where they were actually produced, uh, either farmed or, or mined, to move them to the ocean ports, and from those ports, of course, across the oceans, back to the, the mother country of the empires or onto to global markets, to move these products from points of production to the ports required, obviously, transport infrastructure. Indeed, the most lasting, genuine investment made by the colonial powers, and it was a real investment, in Africa consisted of the railway lines constructed in the first three decades of the 20th century. When I say a lasting investment, I mean precisely that. It is still true today that Africa's principal railway lines and most of the main highways parallel them uh, as well, these railway lines are predominantly the lines that were built 
in the first three decades of the century. Obviously, the, the, the tracks and rails themselves have had to be replaced periodically. But these investments were real investments. Again, this was not cheap, and return was needed and expected from them. If you look at a, a map of, of Africa with the stuff that we're used to seeing removed, that is, uh, remove the borders, uh, remove the, the geological or the, the physical uh, information about the, the geography and so forth, just a map with nothing but the railway lines, it illustrates what we might call the way that, that colonies, economies were, were turned outward, as it were. The connection between the commodity production zone and the wider world through the nexus of the port, this was emphasized, this becomes all important. Now, lateral connections, on the other hand, that might connect point to point within the interior portions of Africa, these tend to, to wane, to, to atrophy. The concentration comes to be on these pathways, the gateways of the ports leading to the points of production and, and back again. So colonial development tended to be highly concentrated around these zones, around the, the plantation areas, around the mining areas, and around these pathways uh, between them to, to the sea. Inside those zones, there's a lot of action. There's a lot of economic activity. In some real senses, there is some growth and development taking place. Outside of those zones, on the other hand, in the hinterlands, away from them, the contrast was plain to see, and in a lot of respects remains plain to see. These hinterland areas tend to be where there is very little in the way of economic action, where populations are dominated by the elderly, by the very young, by females, uh, and places where, uh, in, in many respects, there has been a decline which has, has yet to be reversed. Now, all of this economic transformation that we've been discussing obviously required African labor. Whether this meant African uh, farmers producing peanuts or cocoa on their own land, whether it meant Africans working for wages uh, under European employers on mines or on plantations, whether indeed it meant the labor required, and an enormous amount of it was required, it's fairly obvious, to construct the infrastructure that we're talking about in the first place. Now, this raises an immediate distinction between the era, for instance, of the Atlantic slave trade, at least for West and West Central Africa. Clearly, African labor was absolutely critical in that period as well, but as we all know, it was labor which was forcibly transplanted and set to work, put to work on enterprises producing wealth in a very different part of the world, the New World. In this era, on the other hand, African labor uh, is certainly equally central, but will be in situ. It will be African labor uh, performing that labor uh, in Africa itself. Now, how was this labor to be to be obtained? How was it to be mobilized? The degree and longevity of direct compulsion used to obtain this labor may surprise uh, people. It certainly has a history that lasts well uh, into the, the fifth decade of the century after World War II. It has a long history, it, it turns out, and it was common at varying degrees in all of the territories. In the French, the corvée is the word that, that was certainly used uh, everywhere and often to refer to the drafting of, of labor. In all the colonies, colonial administrations compelled labor for their own administrative purposes. For instance, the collection of tax often required the, uh, the traveling of the, the European officer, and he had to be accompanied by, usually, uh, a fair number of uh, porters, persons carrying belongings to move his camp from, from place to place and, and collect that tax. For the infrastructure itself, I'm thinking here not of the, the railways so much, but of simply the, the crude rural networks of roads. These were maintained very often by labor that was, was compelled. Now again, I don't mean enslaved. This was temporary. It was usually paid, perhaps low wages, but nonetheless paid. But it was also it was not voluntary. 
Now, in some cases, um, particularly in the early Belgian Congo and in the Portuguese uh, colonies, uh, the compulsion went considerably farther and uh, was, the labor was assigned to various private enterprises and private uh, employers. Now, beyond the history of compulsion, and that is, is certainly uh, far from, from the whole story, and it's a story which declines in importance over time. Beyond that, taxation in colonial territories indirectly produced a need to earn colonial currency. Beyond that, many worked quite voluntarily in order to obtain a, a whole range of new desired goods. Again, cultures are changing here, and the desire for Western-style clothing or the iron cookware or eventually the, the, the battery-driven radio and so forth uh, the desire to invest in one's children's education, the desire to bring back resources and invest them in, in the rural homestead operations, the peasant farming operations, and so forth. All of this could motivate and propel or attract a person from one of these hinterlands to enter these zones of intensified production uh, around the, the need and desire for, for export. Now, my reference in the last minute or so to a new range of desired goods suggests the other side of the economic coin uh, in the colonial period. It was hoped that the colonies, as they developed, would provide markets for the manufacturers of the metropole. Again, if the symbol of the industrial age is the factory, it's not simply the raw materials which are being sought out of Africa to put into one side or one end of the factory, if you like, but new customers, new markets to take up and, and purchase the products which came out of the, the other side. We know this was a, a motivation even very uh, early on, or at least a would-be one. Let me go back to a quotation from 1878 from a, a, a figure that we, we met in our last lecture, and that's Henry Morton Stanley, uh, world famous, of course, for his finding of, of Livingston, uh, when Livingston was feared to be lost. But as we'll see in lecture 25 on the creation of the Belgian Congo, certainly uh, an important player in many other respects here as well. He gave a speech in 1878, and this is really before the, the scramble for Africa gets underway, to a group of businessmen in Birmingham, certainly the, the heart of the industrial belt in, in Britain. And uh, it's, it's a speech which, in a sense, where, where Stanley, who is, uh, in a sense, reveling in his own uh, fame at this point, having undertaken some considerable uh, explorations of his own and, and feeling that he, in a sense, was opening the gates, uh, the gateways to, to Africa, he wanted them to get on board uh, in this. And in this short excerpt, he sort of touches all the bases that we looked at in our analysis of the Scramble for Africa, the portrait of, of Africans as, as primitive, the, 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 the need for redemption, but binds that up with the self-interest of the, um, the, the manufacturers of goods as well. Listen to him. There are 40 million naked people behind, beyond that gateway, and the cotton spinners of Manchester are waiting to clothe them. Birmingham's foundries are glowing with the red metal that shall presently be made into ironwork in every fashion and shape for them, and the trinkets that shall adorn those dusky bosoms. And the ministers of Christ are zealous to bring them, the poor benighted heathen, into the Christian fold. Again, you get the, the imagery of Africa and you get the, the evangelical side of this, but it's very much wrapped up in a, a ball of wax that includes new markets. Um, in, this, in this case, Stanley knew well enough that the, the great majority of Africans he encountered were, were not in fact naked, but it doesn't necessarily obviate his point about selling them, in this case, a different kind of clothing, a different style of clothing, and, and so on. If you could sell everybody in Uganda or, or Nigeria or Senegal or the Cote d'Ivoire one pair of shoes a year, or one set of cookware a year. Again, this did represent the tapping of a new uh, kind of market. They were unconvinced in 1878, but a generation later, they're quite convinced. 1897, a columnist, we would call him today, Frederick Greenwood, says, new markets, new markets is the 
constant cry of our captains of industry and merchant princes. And it is well to them that the ear of government should willingly incline. It ought to do so, and it does. So new markets being the cry at this point, taken up not by the sort of cheerleader figures like Stanley, but according to Greenwood, by the, the captains of, of industry themselves. It's nothing peculiar to colonial Africa about this, of course. The founder of my uh, beloved undergraduate alma mater, James B. Duke, was, of course, also the founder of the American Tobacco Company. And I, I read an account recently of how Duke, who was a very rough-hewn type, um, essentially slumbered through a presentation uh, on China at the beginning of the 20th century until um, the <laughs> presenter gave him a figure for the total population of China, at which point he sat upright and said, that's where I'm going to sell cigarettes. And he did. And it was part of the, the success that he had uh, as, as a businessman. Well, let's turn to the political commonalities in colonial uh, Africa for, for a moment. Politically, of course, the African colonies were conquered territories. This was the sort of bottom line that distinguished them uh, as colonial projects as opposed to uh, imperial projects as we defined that in a previous uh, lecture. They were administered as such, as conquered territories, by means which were authoritarian at the least and brutal at, at the most. The lines of political command in colonial Africa ran in theory from the metropolitan capital, from a London or a Paris, from a Brussels, to a colonial governor, almost without exception, uh, a European from the mother country, as we would expect, a white uh, uh, governor, to the, the so-called district officers, also Europeans, also whites, presiding over the the territorial units, the, the provinces, the, the districts, etc., of the uh, colonial territories. Now, I said in theory, and that is in theory. In practice, a considerable amount of discretion was given to the so-called man on the spot, a phrase that you hear a lot in analyses of colonial administration. In other words, this top-down model of policy being set in London and Paris, transmitted to the governors, transmitted from there to the district officers and so forth, uh, often was, was honored in the, the breach. The bottom line objectives of colonial administration were to maintain order, above all, to keep the exports flowing, and to collect the tax. How exactly these were achieved was, to some degree, secondary. And how a particular district officer, who after all was often operating in tremendous isolation uh, in, in far from the capital, far from others who might oversee his particular uh, um, procedures or, or innovations in order to achieve these ends. Again, a lot of latitude allowed to, to the, the man on the spot. Now, the final guarantors of order in colonial situations, as, as in any other situation, were the security forces, the police and the, the military. Now, these were, again, almost universally commanded, as we would expect, by, by Europeans uh, coming from the, the metropole. But the policemen themselves, the ordinary soldiers, the NCOs, the non-commissioned officers, in these security forces were usually Africans, and often selected or, or recruited for such work uh, based upon uh, stereotypical, in some cases, um, conceptions about particular ethnic groups, particular so-called tribes, which were said to be cut out for such work. In other words, who could be trusted to be, to be tough, to be brutal if need be, Again, the oldest rule of empire probably divide and rule, and if we can utilize persons from one ethnic group to maintain order over another, uh, so be it. Now, it was at the level just below the, the district officer that, to me, things really get interesting. Remember that practically every 
colony, incorporated numerous ethnic groups and a whole panoply, therefore, of previously independent government structures, previously independent rulers. It's a common misconception, I find this at least to my undergraduate students, that with, with colonial conquest that African political structures were simply smashed uh, in, in that process. This was often, I would say, in fact, usually not, not the case. They may have been defeated, they may have concluded that resistance was futile and, and found with themselves with little alternative but to, to tender submission of one sort or another and usually with, with great bitterness and regret. But nonetheless, they were still around. I'm talking about African kings, chiefs, headmen, still largely around as, of course, were their rivals, pretenders to their, to their thrones or, or positions or offices. Uh, and so forth. Now there were some cases where authority figures were not around and that tended to be in those stateless societies which we took a brief look at at least in uh, lecture number six. If the oldest rule of empire is divide and rule, perhaps the second oldest uh, would be something like this, that virtually all empires find it necessary, indeed find it advisable, to make use of authority figures drawn from the subject populations. African empires were no exception in this case. For reasons of numbers alone, again, relatively few Europeans were actually involved in the running of Europe's empires in Africa. For reasons of low numbers alone, then, they needed the African chiefs and I'll simply use chiefs as the, the sort of catch-all term here for the kinds of authority figures drawn from the subject population that I'm referring to. They needed them to maintain this order. They needed them to settle disputes, particularly minor disputes. The district officers, let alone those in the capital, didn't want to get involved in, in minor or petty crimes or let alone in domestic uh, disputes or what we would call civil disagreements or, or what have you. If we could have that taken care of by a pre-existing chief or king, fine. And of course, to collect the labor, to turn it out, this is another phrase from the, from the old colonial period, to, to collect the taxes. There came to be a dependence upon the African chief, the African authority figure to assist at the least and to carry that out at the most. Now, although the British made a, a virtue out of this necessity and eventually a sort of fetish about propping up the indigenous authorities through their policy of indirect rule, and I'm going to say more about that next time because it is a difference in the flavor between uh, British uh, colonial administration and the others. Nonetheless, all of the empires in Africa were to a larger or, or smaller degree in the same boat. The African chief then, or move up the scale, the African king, or a bit down the scale, the African headman, then found himself in a delicate man-in-the-middle position under colonial rule. His followers expected him to, if he had any claim to legitimacy or respect, to essentially voice their own concerns to the authority structure higher up, whether it was the taxation is too great a burden or we've been giving up too many young men uh, for, for, for forced labor or, or what have you. They expected their chief or their king to articulate these grievances to the, the colonial uh, rulers. But of course the rulers had their own expectations as we have seen. They expected the chief's assistance in carrying out these critical colonial mandates of keeping peace, collecting taxes, recruiting labor, uh, and settling disputes. Now, if you do the first job too well, and the first job is to articulate the grievances of your own followers, if you do that job too well, you run the risk of being replaced by someone, frankly, whom the authorities find more cooperative. If you do the second job, on the other hand, too well and become an all too efficient or 
uh, valuable assistance in the carrying out of these colonial mandates, you run another kind of risk, and that is a thorough alienation from the very people whom you are, uh, in, in theory, the, the ruler over, at least the ruler of, of indigenous record over, and you risk being labeled a sellout, a stooge, and rejected by your own people. This actually carries forward with some interesting implications into the nationalist movements and the nationalist era, which we, which we look at uh, quite soon in the course, because this position of being on the fence and the position, the risks of falling, if one leans too far one way or another while on the fence, of course, increases in its delicacy as we get into the nationalist era, where nationalists are seeking the support of chiefs in their own anti-colonial agenda, and we see that some chiefs wind up being celebrated as sort of heroes of the nationalist movements, and others indeed uh, denounced, in some cases attacked or even assassinated. Okay, the African chief under colonial rule. We've spoken then of economic and political commonalities, which I think span and embrace the experience, the colonial experience, across most or all of the, uh, the empires in Africa. Let's turn to the cultural side. Culturally, colonial rule meant, of course, the institutionalization of notions of white supremacy and of European culture as the model for uh, civilization. This in turn meant that Western-style education, and here we can make another generalization, this was dominated in virtually every territory for most of the first half of the 20th century by Christian missionary activities, by Christian missionary societies and operations. That Western-style education was the key to the limited advancement available to Africans in the colonial system. And by that uh, advancement, I mean the possibility of becoming, for instance, a clerk was a word that you hear a lot in the colonial period. You know, the educated clerk, the person who was literate, could, could work, uh, you know, could do the accounts for a district officer, for instance, as an assistant, or in a court, as a court reporter, as a shop assistant, a, a, a person carrying out the, uh, the business of, of a merchant. Uh, and let us not forget that, of course, Africans by the thousands become uh, teachers themselves. They become clergymen, and in some cases, clergywomen themselves. And a key to any of these kinds of relative advancement is, of course, Western-style education. Now, a vast literature has developed, which includes many distinguished novels and stories and, and, and films and so on, uh, which plums the, the psychological and social implications of these new realities, of, of the, the Western model of, of white or what it meant at a human and psychological level to be ruled by, to, by outsiders. And, you know, when we look at the novels of, of Ngugi from Kenya or, or of Achebe or Soyinka from Nigeria or Sangor from Sen Senegal, uh, we're looking at people who wrestle us. In some ways, you could almost say that dealing with the realities of uh, colonial rule in the most basic sense uh, constitutes the, the great theme of 20th century African literature. Now, Africans' responses, which you can again see so many variations in these works of art, to the new realities ran a huge and complex range from embarrassing imitation uh, an emulation on one uh, side to, to outright rejection of the Western model and rebellion on the other. In between a great many people, and I mean ordinary people in colonial situations, trod an uneasy ground of ambivalence, ambiguity, mixed emotions, of syncretism, of, of the mixing of, of cultural traditions, both indigenous and imported. We can close, though, with one observation which foreshadows our later look at African nationalism. Many of those who led the anti-colonial revolt were in fact those who had gone farthest in systems of Western education, 
we'll revisit that point uh, in a lecture or two. So, we have described today then some commonalities of colonial systems. In our next lecture, we will turn to some differences between colonial empires in Africa and how some of them at least change considerably over time. Thank you.